My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. Today is Friday, October 19th, 2012, and I'm in Stillwater, Oklahoma, interviewing Patrick Wires as part of the O State Stories Oral History Project. Thank you for so, so much for joining us today. Welcome back to OSU. We're so happy to have you with us. Well, thank you, Juliana. Patrick, let's begin by learning a little bit more about you. Could you tell us uh, the year you were born and where you grew up? Okay. I was born in Quinton, Oklahoma, in June the 8th, 1934. Lived there just briefly to gain a little strength and go with my mother back to her home because she was spending time with her sister during his childbirth. And uh, we moved from there to my father's farm in McAllister, near McAllister, Oklahoma, and stayed there several years. And uh, at the age of about three, I decided I was going to capture Santa Claus and waited at the chimney for a long time. Checked that chimney in there for 15 minutes to see if he was coming down it. But I fell asleep, and uh, when I woke up, he'd already come and gone. So we moved from there to uh, an aunt's home uh, uh, because of economic times, and uh, Gene Smith, and uh, uh, lived there for a brief period of time, and then on to my grandmother's home in Stigler, Oklahoma. And it was there that I started first grade, and it was there that I quit first grade. Very few people know this, except immediate members of the family. Uh, I'm uh, probably the only college graduate that dropped out of the first grade. How'd you, how'd you drop out? Why'd you drop out? I didn't like the teacher. Mm. <laughs> Therefore, I just played with my good friend Charles Stevenson. I leave house like I was going to school and my mother knew what was going on but she didn't demand that I, that she didn't take me by the hand and she take me back to school. So anyway, uh, after that Charles and I entered first grade together and went right on through. And it wasn't until I was in the fifth grade that a fifth grade girlfriend was asked where her where she was going to school college mm -hmm. and she said I'm going to Oklahoma and m that's where my brother is going and little did I even give you more thought to it that later in life we would move from Stigler in 1950 starting my sophomore year to Stillwater and um, I uh, must give credit which I'm leaving this DVD with you to my brother Paul T who because of his success in high school uh, was given by a home demonstration club one semester of books and tuition to Oklahoma and him because of his outstanding work and success as a high school graduate from Stigler High School. So in the fall of 1950, through a friend of my brother's, all of our furniture was loaded on a cattle truck and was headed for Stillwater. In the truck was the cab, in the truck cab was my mother, my young sister Laquita, an uncle of mine, Douglas, and the driver. In the back was my younger brother Scotty, who felt he was safe enough from shifting furniture that his life wasn't going to be in danger. But Paul and myself, knowing that that could shift, and injure a leg or arm or whatever, we hitchhiked from Stigler to Stillwater. 
spent the longest time of getting a ride in Perkins, Oklahoma, only 10 miles from Stillwater, from the OH, that was Oklahoma campus, Oklahoma State campus. But we did get a ride in and arrived about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. My mother had leased a home on McElroy Street. So that's where we lived the first few years we were here. And uh, from that point, then we moved because this older brother, Sam, lived in Veterans Village due to his World War II service. There was housing coming available for people that needed inexpensive housing. So we moved to that village and lived there uh, while I attended school and Paul finished and uh, my younger brother Scotty enrolled and finished and my young sister Laquita finished. In that interim time there my mother decided because she'd had one year of college at Oklahoma University uh, she would enter the school of OSU, School of Education. So three of my relatives, Mother, Scotty, and Laquita, all became school teachers. Hmm. Paul received a degree in industrial engineering, and I received one in mechanical engineering. And um, so that's why it's so important that this person be given credit. So when when Paul got the scholarship and he was had his mind set on going to Oklahoma A and M, how did the family decide? Well, we're all moving to Stillwater. Was it a? It was a decision that my mother and my brother made. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I see it in the the photograph. Did Paul play sports? Oh yes, yes, and. Uh, <clears throat> Here's the picture of the football team. And should I put it in? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. With only two people identified, I do know the others, but uh, for this interview, I decided I just use that. And also, I have documents of his obituary along with statements of, from my brother Sam and his wife as well as the statement I made at his funeral in Lakewood, Colorado February, oh, it was a little later that we had the services. It's February the 19th. He passed on February the 1st of this year. And his wife of 50 years is buried at Arlington National Cemetery as is he. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were a couple of years younger than Paul. Three. Okay. And so when you came to Stillwater you enrolled at the high school? Yes. And what was that experience like for you? Well, here I'd grown up in a 3,000 population city, Stickler, Oklahoma, and knew everyone from first grade on up. So it was a big transition for me to move into uh, a new school that was much larger and uh, uh, not knowing anyone except the day I arrived, uh, friend Bob Williams befriended me, and we became good friends for many, many years. And as far as I know, still are. But he lives uh, in Colorado. I don't know if he's in the Denver area or Boulder area. But last time I, I did get to talk with Bob uh, a few, last year, or two years ago, and ask how he was doing everything, but. Because so many years had passed, you could tell that uh, bond was not as strong as when you were in high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, first year, 
I didn't play sports. I just felt I needed to concentrate on getting adjusted to the school and the lessons that were being given. But my junior and senior year, I did play and had good acceptance and good, good success. But unfortunately, <laughs> in playing that contact sport, <clears throat> I lost half of my front tooth in one of the games against Tulsa Central in Tulsa, Oklahoma on the Skelly Stadium football field. Mr. Bob Timberlake uh, of the Tulsa football team wanted to see if I could take a bite out of his helmet, but it was intentional movement by his head to my face that caught the tooth and lost half of it. Hmm. But fortunately, the only pain immediate was because when you're playing sports, you breathe a lot through your mouth, and I could feel the cold air passing over the tooth that had been broken. But Saturday morning I went to the dentist and he put a cap on it and that lasted for 20 years. Wow. 20 years exactly. But uh, in my football career <laughs> at Stillwater I was very fortunate in a football game in Blackwell, Oklahoma. Uh, the team was according to our coach, not doing too well. Um, it seemed like it, he got the impression we were just having too much fun on the bench as well as out on the field. And in those days, you know, football was like a job. It was serious. And so uh, <clears throat> a few of us who seemed to be having more fun than some others were on the bench for a while. And then at the, near the end of the game, he put us in. And uh, in the only game where ever I was able to score a touchdown, the, offending, the opposing team quarterback threw a ball that had been partially blocked and it wobbled in the air and I ran for it and got it, but I was headed like I was going to the bench of our team. Mm -hmm. I didn't really put on any speed until one of the opposing players said, he's got the ball, he's got the ball. So then I increased my pace and uh, about the 10 yard line before we reached the goal line, he was moving to tackle me from behind. And I was able to put my hand behind my back and push his helmet down to where I was able to go across the football, across the goal line and score the touchdown. However, the announcer in the booth misidentified the player and gave Jim Remy the credit for the touchdown. <laughs> but we did win the we did win a football game, so it wasn't due to that foot but that touchdown though. But anyway, it was a big highlight for myself as a football player. When you were in high school did you have a part time job? Oh yes. Where did you work? I worked at uh, a drugstore right across from the fire station here on the campus. And it was a drugstore owned by a good friend of mine's father, Mr. Fiscus, and a partner of his. And um, uh, I uh, was a uh, uh, soda jerk. Okay. This is what they called them. Uh -huh. But we also fixed sandwiches and soup for people and stuff. And got acquainted with some of the students who were in the fire department here okay. as educational purposes. And I learned that from the firemen that if the coffee was too hot, he would put his spoon in it and let it cool down to where he could then drink it safely without burning his mouth. Hmm. And um, that possibly was the first introduction to how to, in one way, to cool slowly coffee. Hmm. 
Interesting. By putting a spoon, a cold spoon in it, not what it was, you know, just a normal temperature of the room, but it was still colder than the coffee. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the student's name, but he was a very talkative and sociable fellow. And uh, prior to that, though, in Stigler, Oklahoma, I had many jobs. Mm -hmm. First one was about 11 year old selling garden seed to neighbors, so I could earn a money if I wanted, or I could earn a Red Rider BB gun. And then later I worked in the theater taking tickets. This was in Stigler, of course. And then I became a soda jerk for a pharmacy there in Stigler, and after school I would. Uh, worked there and this was all before I started playing sports and I also worked in a dry cleaning business pressing pants and shirts and doing necessary stuff in the back uh, washing pants and pre-washing them as well as uh, working for a Chevrolet company in the uh, weekends uh, working in a body shop, working on cars that needed painting and repairing so they could put them on a used car lot and sell them. And uh, the dirtiest job I had for that company was uh, washing down the grease rack, mm. which at your age you probably don't ever see those anymore because they were um, a very highly contaminating procedure in that uh, you use kerosene to loosen up the excess grease that dropped down on the floor and then you used a high pressure hose to wash it into the drain where it went as you now know is into sometimes um, streams and valleys but uh, you didn't have a lot of free time. No, no, uh, but it wasn't terribly bad, but uh, I guess the easiest money I ever made was uh, going to the fairgrounds after a big football game and going beneath the stands and finding coins as well as sometimes a dollar bill that had fallen out of people's pockets. And I still recall today my first experience with the Roosevelt dime. At that time, your dimes had mercury on them. Picture of mercury with, but this was a new coin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt coin that had his picture on it. And I had to wonder if that was going to be accepted by merchants, but it was. But um, anyway, I would go like I say on Saturday morning over that football field and I couldn't believe it though when I found that Roosevelt Diamond where I found it. I found it out near the goal post huh. where young people had gone out at halftime and had wrestled and played and lost some money. Hmm. Well let's let's get back to Stillwater. We took a little detour there. Oh yeah. So in high school you know the time is probably coming for you to graduate oh, yeah. and was just attending Oklahoma A&M the plan all along? Oh yes, it was the dream of my mother uh, and her brother Paul to uh, enable us to enter Oklahoma State University and uh, finish school. And so, you know, your, your freshman year, uh, did you know what you wanted to major in already? Well, again, Brother Paul says, you know, I'm an industrial engineering major, and I think that you'd be a good mechanical engineering major. So I said, well, I guess that I'll work in that area, but uh, it was a struggle and, um, for me, but uh, I persevered, as most of us in the Wires family have done over the years, and was able to complete my schooling, of course, with the assistance of my wife that I married in 1959. Well, how did you meet your wife? Well, as I said, I did struggle with my subject matters here at Oklahoma State, 
And so in 1957, the Stillwater Draft Board said, you're eligible to serve your country for two years. So I was drafted and left for Fort Houston, Virginia, uh, latter part of December of 58, latter part of December of 57, en route to Fort Eustis, Virginia. And I'm happy to, to tell you that in the en route, I was able to go see this older sister of mine, um, Ot Otika John East, who lived in Willoughby, Ohio, and spent a few days with her and her family, and then on to Washington, D.C., and uh, train had about an hour and a half lay over there, so I, for the first time in my life, left the train station, Union Station at Washington, D.C., hiked up to the capital of the United States of America, all the way up the steps, many, many steps, I didn't count them, but I looked out over the city on January the 1st of 1958. And very, I didn't see anyone moving at 8 a.m. that morning around the city of, Fort, of Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. from the Capitol steps. And I later reflected on how Napoleon must have felt when he arrived in Moscow and nobody gave him the keys to the city. But he was much more disappointed than I. I was just en route to serve my country for two years at Fort Eustace. So, on July the 25th, 1958, I was, went on a blind date with the lady who later became my wife. Her name is Mary Ellen Abel, A-B-E-L-L, -L, who lived in Crozet, spelled C-R-O-Z-E-T, Virginia which is just west of Charlottesville. She and three other of her friends, nursing students at the University of Virginia School of Nursing, were on spring break at Newport News, Virginia, staying at the home of Mary Alice Price. And they had met some of my friends from this service uh, a few days earlier. And so this one friend of mine says, I can't make it to go on this date with Mary Ellen, so won't you go? I've got guard. I have guard duty. So I went. And that's when I met Mary Ellen. And we dated from then until I left Fort Hughes of Virginia in 19, latter part of 1959 to come back to OSU, finish my study. And I must say that um, because we had had been so fond of each other that in October of 1959, I called her and asked her to marry me. And she said, I'll have to get back to you on that. Wow. <laughs> so three days later, <laughs> she called and said the wedding is December 20th at four o'clock at Mount Moriah United Methodist Church and you best be there. So, I did, because that was the winter kind of break in classes. So we were married on December 20, 1959, honeymooned in Washington, D.C., and was able to, each of us, to watch and then President Eisenhower light the national Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. And later on, in 60, when our first child was born, um, September 22nd, um, she, Mary Ellen, said, you know, my friends, uh, my mothers, are back there counting on their fingers the number of months from the time we were married until our baby arrived. And so they finally concluded that he was a honeymoon baby, which he was. And that's Randolph Zane Wires, who is now 52 years old. So that's the background on 
her, but she has a longer story because her interest was education. Her mother was a, a teacher, but she wanted one to be a dean of a school of nursing and um, earn more money than her mother had ever made, which she did. She became the associate dean of the School of Nursing at University of Texas at Arlington in Arlington, Texas. An interesting story about that, Juliana, is that as she was, as she completed her doctorate work, our daughter, who was probably 12 or 13, says, Mom, do I still call you Mom or do I have to call you Doctor? <laughs> And now that daughter, Suzanne Ava Wires, York is her married name, is 48 years old and has two sons, which I have documentation on one of them that I'm going to leave with you. That the youngest of her sons, Connor, incidentally his name's Connor Patrick York. And uh, he was on a Argyle Eagle basketball team his senior year to win the state 3A championship in basketball. And I'm leaving a picture of him with that information that was submitted to the Chickasaw Times paper. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the your Chickasaw heritage. Um, yeah. Was it always a, a big part of your life growing up being Chickasaw? For my mother it was, since her uh, interest was uh, uh, and her lineage was from the Chickasaw Nation mm -hmm. and my father's was from the Choctaw Nation but when we applied for enrollee membership uh, Choctaw and the Chickasaw Nation had kind of proposed that you couldn't hold membership in each, even though the father was Choctaw and the mother was Chickasaw. You had to just be a member of one. And so as kind of you do, you follow the lineage of your mom, since she was the one pushing and wanted each of us to always be a Chickasaw member of, the, of that nation. Well, when you came back to OSU to finish up your degree, where were you living at the time? Uh, my wife and I <laughs> rented a one-bedroom, one-bath apartment on 404 Elm Street here in Stillwater. And uh, I would go to class, but prior to going to class, because we had the child, Randolph, well, I would take him to babysitter early morning, take her to her work, which started at 7 a.m. It still wanted me in this hospital. Then I would go to class, and then I would go pick him up, take care of him, and go pick her up, or pick her up because she shipped in at three. Mm -hmm. Was it was it different coming back to campus after you know your service in the military, and now you had a family where you're priorities a little different? Oh yes, yes, you mature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. And uh, the only way that we were going to really move ahead was me finish school and go to work, which I did for the Boeing Company in 1962. Uh, and uh, first assignment was the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama, where Dr. Von Braun and his team was working to perfect the engines for the Saturn V program. And um, I worked there for four and a half months. Then on to New Orleans, Louisiana. Actually it was Chalmette, which is a little community south of New Orleans, where the Michoud, M-I-C-H-O-U-D, plant was located. It had been a plant that had been built by the Kaiser people to build wooden aircraft because aluminum was so rare and getting very much more scarce. Uh, 
However, the successful ending of the war, uh, it was mothballed and uh, just kept as part of the military establishment until something better or better came along or, or some higher purpose for it to be used. So it was then activated to a house room to build a huge first stage and second stage of the Saturn V program. Mm -hmm. And um, fortunately that program was very successful and in July the 20th, 1969, Mr. Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon, along with the second one, Buzz Aldrin. And um, I was fortunate after moving to Fort Worth to um, meet and shake the hand of Alan Bean, who graduated from Pasco High School and still in uh, Fort Worth. I don't remember what year, but anyway, he also was fortunate to be in that program and walked on the moon. So it was a very good time for me because I approached him and asked him if he would be kind enough to sign his autograph for my son Randolph and my son Randolph's good friend Brian. So he said, be glad to. So he gave me a little slip of paper with his mission number on it and in his name. So it was um, uh, one of the highlights for my success in that program. And then uh, after that came to a close in 66, I was hired by General Namix in Fort Worth to work on the, then it was called the controversial F-111 airplane. And it was a pretty advanced aircraft in that the wings would swing back as a speed increased and then swing forward for landing purposes. And that, again, was a successful program. I worked in the structural flight test program there uh, because currently our good Australian friends are still flying that aircraft and they think it's one of the best ones they've ever had. Mm -hmm. And a boy, and the General Namish, I guess, has certain facilities to, or license them to make the necessary repair parts for the aircraft. Well, at what point did you get into real estate? Well, <laughs> my uh, experience in the federal government working for, I coined it, the Federal Buffalo Program. And that was moving about the country on various defense programs. It became very tiring and upsetting for my family to move. And so, in 72, I left the engineering field and learned the real estate business through a broker there. And prior to that, though, my wife and I had already bought some investment properties that were fortunately income-producing properties. In 69, we bought them, late 69. And uh, she had gotten advice from her father that says, Mary Ellen Pat, if you have any excess monies, I suggest you invest it in real estate. And so that's what we started doing. And uh, I then later op opened my own brokerage company in 1974. And from that point, then uh, I was in it up to my ears in rental property and also selling properties. And um, had very good success in that until 1987 when things just started deteriorating badly in the real estate business due to one, the government regulations and programs that were set up to, in one sense, uh, protect the buying public. They felt that the government needed to protect individuals from uh, making bad decisions mm. and being taken advantage of. 
But then I went to work for a company that, with the company of investors who were buying commercial properties because they were so cheap and they had the money to buy commercial properties. And so right in Fort Worth, I started in 19, June of 1987. I closed my business May the 31st of 1987 and went to work for them in June the 15th of 1987 and worked for them managing a pretty large complex of commercial buildings in uh, Fort Worth until 1993. When then I experienced my first serious health problem. Mm -hmm. And my wife, being a nurse, knew what probably would happen if I didn't get early treatment. And uh, fortunately for me, I had a wonderful primary physician who followed me every year, physical time, and then said, You need to go to a specialist and have that prostate gland checked. So I did. I went to Dr. Sidney Worsham, and he followed me from 1989 until 1993 when he said, Mr. Wires, I'm going to have to take some samples of that because it doesn't look good. And so he did, and six samples and three, no, six samples, three on each lobe, and five of them came back precancerous. So, he said, you have some options, and he gave me all those options. And my wife and I went to the Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas and got a second option. And I'll never forget the doctor's name, Sagalowski. <clears throat> and he says, you know, you can have the gland removed, and at your age, I suggest that, which was, at that time, 59 and a half. Mm -hmm. But he said, I'll put you in touch with a radiologist, and he'll tell you what they can do for you, but if it were me, I'd have it removed. And so that's what was done. And a very successful work by Dr. Worsham in that at that time uh, he was doing what was called the nerve sparing method. And uh, in that sense, uh, he was most successful in sparing the nerve so that I wouldn't be incontinent or impotent. And uh, so that was 93 and that's when I left the management of that and then just worked on my own, managing my own residential rental properties and buying a few others. So are you retired today or? No. Uh, I. Uh, I'm carrying notes on four of the properties that in 12 more years, three of those properties will be paid off and one of those four will be paid off again in about another seven years. And fortunately, all except one of those properties, all except one, are right on time in payment. In fact, the matter is my son-in-law calls calls those checks I receive each month, mailbox money. And uh, you, just one of those though is always struggling to make that payment, but he makes it. <laughs> God, he says I have too much money invested in that property to lose it. And so as long as he keeps thinking that, and that's true, he does. He has approximately right now $33,000 mm. that he paid down payment for 7700 because I wasn't going to accept a 5% or 3% down payment. I was, because I'd seen too much bad things happen from in the rental business. I'm guessing it's also a tougher business today than it was 20, 30 years ago. Well, it must not be because my son, Randolph, has approximately 43 to 45 properties in Longview, Texas. Wow. That he handles. But he has also other areas of interest of making money. Hmm. 
like owning commercial building, uh, owning a car wash, <laughs> self-service car wash, um, laundry service, not laundry, but a washeteria. Sure. And I don't know what other areas he's involved in because he's very, very busy, but he has three boys that he has to, he's already put one through university and uh, he's been successful. That's Riley Randolph Wires. And uh, the second one will be graduating. Nicholas Zane Wires will be graduating from A&M, Texas A&M, uh, December the 14th of this year. And then my daughter's two boys, uh, Car Carson, the oldest, will be finishing at Texas A&M in business in May of 2013. And his younger brother, Connor, the state championship basketball player, will be going into his sophomore year in 2013 at A&M. So I have four grandsons at Texas A&M currently. I won't hold it against you. Well, uh, in-state tuition. That's true. Is very reasonable. However, my daughter brought Carson up here to A&M, or OSU, to see the campus and see, and he was offered a scholarship by OSU to come here, but because he grew up and his cousins had gone to A&M, Texas A&M, that's where he wanted to go. Well, I guess they're in the SEC now, so yeah. not a big deal. Well, they were in the Big 12, then, <laughs> then maybe maybe it'd be fighting words. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you, you look back on your time here at OSU, are there any key moments that just really stand out? Well. A professor, uh, L. Fila, F I L A, uh, was not my advisor, but I had a number of classes with him. And so he knew that uh, where I lived in the village, that uh, I could probably use some work. So he said, We have a wind tunnel that needs to be removed from a room, and would you be interested in? disassembling it. And I said, certainly. So uh, I took his direction and he coached me along being very careful with these particular parts of the wind tunnel and so I disassembled it and then it was stored in one of the huge storage buildings around here and uh, later he said, uh, my wife and I are going to be moving. I'm going to go back to advanced, get advanced degree, and so would you be good enough to, um, I'll pay you, he said, uh, to help us pack stuff and move and load it and stuff. And I said, well, certainly. So uh, when he set out some of the things that he was going to let the garbage people pull, take, I asked him, I said, Mr. Fila, are you, Professor Fila, are you going to discard this nice radio? wooden cabinet and had uh, broadband and anyway in it and so he said yeah I said well if you don't mind I'll just take it and take it check the tubes and see sure enough just one tube need to be replacing so I replaced it and I live with that radio until about four years ago when I had an estate sale and that uh, maybe, maybe my son took it. I know what my daughter said. I'd like to have that radio. And I said, you can take it just in time. You can take it. But she never did. So I think my son took it. Hmm. But anyway, Professor Fila was very good about uh, working with me and helping me in the camp hall. In, in the, earning money here in OSU. Mm -hmm. And I met a number of other young students, uh, one of them Dr. Gerald Parker, who was a friend of my brother Paul, and he 
I said, you know, Pat, we're having a Toastmasters meeting here and I'd like you to come. And I says, okay. So went to the Toastmasters speaker and, and listened and uh, he had a very humorous speaker that evening who uh, read an article using um, sounds to emphasize certain parts of his talk. And it was very humorous and entertaining. And Dr. Parker said, uh, you know, it would probably help you if you join the Toastmasters. But I spent many, many hours here in this library studying for my classes. And so I didn't join the Toastmasters. I did participate in a few of the other events that happened, uh, primarily basketball games at Iba Stadium over there and uh, at that time Coach Iba had a son, Mo Iba, that was Stillwater High, same class as my younger brother Scotty. And so I got acquainted with Mo, just knew who he was and he knew who I was, but uh, never did have any real first-hand acquaintance with his father. Hank Iba, but uh, also the time uh, OSU has always had a good wrestling team, mm -hmm. and at the time the top wrestler at the time I was here was Myron Roderick, mm -hmm. and it's the only time I'm aware of and possibly the only time it's ever happened that the basketball stadium was filled the night that Mr. Roderick was wrestling. And I did yet <laughs> don't really truthfully know if he won his match or not, but I strongly suspect he did. But uh, I was also in attendance at a football game where football player from the opposing team um, was deliberately incapacitated by an OS Oklahoma State a and football player named F.A. Dry and that Dry had delivered a forearm to the jaw of the man and, let, and caused him to leave the game. Mr. Dry and I uh, had a later meeting at a Lions Club in Fort Worth when he was asked to be a speaker uh, at our club. And I had to ask him if he really intentionally uh, broke the jaw of Johnny Bright at the time. And he wouldn't reply. Really? No. Because at that time he was coaching Texas Christian University in football. But uh, I was able to enjoy those sporting events at Oklahoma State and many of the other areas, but those are kind of most the memorable ones and enjoyable ones. What buildings would you have most of your classes in? Engineering building, not any particular um, classroom number or anything like that, but in, uh, I do recall uh, uh, Professor Soderstrom in the shop area teaching us how to use the lathe and uh, heat treating materials and uh, my brother Paul T had the same experience with Mr. Soderstrom and uh, he Soderstrom was quite a jokester in that he uh, often would uh, instruct a student to pick up a piece of material that he knew was hot instead of the student using what 
my brother Paul T said it was common sense like putting his hand above the material before he grabbed it. <laughs> That's one way to learn. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, and then uh, I can't recall the name of the professor that uh, taught surveying, but uh, that was a an experience too when we were walking over with transits and other tapes and stuff, measuring, and students walking by wondering what was going on. And uh, we just told them that uh, oh, we're going to build a railroad right through the campus. Did you spend any time in the stu student union? Well, this picture says I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was spending some time there. You apparently were taking a little break there. But that was before classes started. Ah. And, um, before you went into the service, did you attend any dances or? Yes, yes, a few times. Uh, we, Bob Williams and I and all had the student union there. They would have dances and uh, we would attend those. but. Young ladies at that time were very interested in school, and uh, we young men needed to get an education and uh, in the areas that possibly we could make a living at. So we didn't socialize too much with the young ladies on campus, although we'll have to say. That. Remember the young lady that in the fifth grade that I said mm -hmm. her brother was going out on playing the end? Well, she later enrolled here and we reacquainted. But sadly, and I don't know, I guess it was time and so much time had passed that we just had one date. Mm -hmm. And uh, prior to her enrolling, she had been involved in a serious and automobile accident and uh, she hadn't been disfigured or anything she just had some mobility problems to a degree not anything's really bad but what year did Paul T graduate I is it 54 55 okay so you had some time where both of you were taking classes at the oh, same yes. time on campus. Yeah. But he, like <clears throat> all of us, uh, in going to high school and only into college, uh, uh, he was very fortunate to get to work for one of the, lab the labs here and uh, doing drafting work for some of the engineers that were working on research projects. And he did that for several years. So uh, very seldom did I see him or talk to him because he was very busy with his studies as well as working that particular job. So we, he did advise me on, uh, he enrolled in the ROTC program and uh, was when asked if he wanted to continue to get a commission, he continued. But as he learned what was going on and how serious uh, <clears throat> military service was, he suggested to me that I not participate in advanced ROTC, that I complete my first two years and let it go and spend my time studying. So I did that. And uh, like I say, he was a very big influence on my life. And as a result, I attended services of his uh, in Denver, or Lakewood, suburb of Denver. And then uh, June the 15th, when he was buried at National Cemetery in 
Arlington, Virginia, I made the trip to represent our family at his burial. And all of his children were there. Some of our cousins from my oldest sister's family were there. As well, family was well represented, uh, more so than the immediate family of my brother. His younger brother, Scotty, says, I attended his service in Lakewood, and I'm not going to the National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. And my older brother, Sam, had uh, fallen and broken his hip, so he said he couldn't attend. So I made the trip, and uh, very happy that I'm thankful that I was able to do so. And uh, as I got off the metro there in Washington, D.C., another couple got off, and uh, the lady walking real fast ahead of me looked familiar, and sure enough, it was one of my cousins from my oldest sister's family, Debbie Turner, that I recognized and spoke to, and then her husband. <laughs> was walking a little bit behind me <laughs> and uh, he said, I felt I saw you get off that metro and uh, so sure enough we got to walk then onto the reception area where we waited till all the family assembled and then went to the cemetery for the burial site. Uh, I must add that uh, other members of my family, my mother and my father, are buried at Fort Gibson National Cemetery near Muskogee, Oklahoma. And um, he was buried there in 1965. And um, in uh, 1998, my mother was buried there. She lived to be 98. And my father sadly lived only be for 67 years. But uh, like I say, those two members of my family are at National Cemeteries. I've <clears throat> signed all the documentation and sent it to the funeral home of uh, where I'm to be buried and I'm going to be buried at the National Cemetery in Grand Prairie, Texas. And uh, my wife, Mary Ellen, is buried in um, the cemetery at, behind the Mount Moriah United Methodist Church in Crozet, Virginia. And what's interesting about that, Juliana, is that on July the 25th of 1999, my daughter Suzanne, her two boys, Mary Ellen and I, were visiting her mother at her home in Crozet, Virginia. And after church services, Mary Ellen walked over to my daughter and said, Suzanne, when I pass away, I'm going to be buried right here. And right here, where she pointed, is where she is buried because she passed away on July the 29th of 1999. And uh, if you recall, I met her on July the 25th of 1958. So on July the 29th, she had a massive heart attack in 1999 and passed away. She was born at the University of Virginia Hospital and she died at University of Virginia Hospital. She was born in 19, May the 15th, 1938. She died July the 29th, 1999. I want to go back to your mother for a second. When you were, before you went into the service, you all lived in Vet Village together? Yes, sure did. And was that different? I mean, were there many 
Was that a different type of family setup than other people around? Well, at the time, of course, <clears throat> uh, yes, I would say that possibly we were the only family in Stillwater High School that lived in Fenton Village. I didn't know of any others. But in the home we had there, it was uh, on the first floor, fortunately. There was an upstairs, but another family lived upstairs. But they were veterans. And uh, living in that home was uh, Brother Paul, myself, Scotty, and Laquita, and my mother. How big was it? How many rooms? Uh, there must have been three bedrooms at least and one bath. But uh, when I was in high school, I could still re I could recall, or I experienced anyway, as I was getting ready to sleep, the drone of the B-36 aircraft that flew its missions out of Fort Worth north. Uh, just the most different sound that you'll ever hear other than uh, hear it from the B-36 aircraft. And um, that was our base of living and operation until uh, we moved from there over to, uh, I don't remember what year it was, but to the apartments on Elm Street. And uh, of course, Brother Paul had already gone into service in the Air Force. And, uh, very seldom returned home. I do recall him sending money to my mom when he, Paula, was still single. And uh, so that was very helpful. Was your mom working in town? No, mother had a full time job with her children. Mm -hmm. Full time cooking, cleaning, and washing. And she was very much a stickler on cleanliness and personal hygiene. She just wasn't going to tolerate dirty <laughs> clothes or dirty children. <laughs> and I'm sure because of that is the reason that we stayed, I think, very healthy, mm -hmm. very healthy conditions. And you said she went on to teach school? She, after receiving her degree, taught for at least 15, maybe even longer years. And uh, she was a very determined and uh, wise mother. She knew that the only way that we were going to really better ourselves was get as much education as we could. Which has proven to be very, very true. Mm -hmm. But I must again go back to uh, being able to convince Mary Ellen that uh, she made a wise choice when she married me. And uh, because of her support and interest in uh, acquiring uh, assets with her working and me working and our children not making great big demands and also not uh, participating in uh, questionable or unreasonable activities. Uh, we were able to, uh, Mary and I, to accumulate possibly more assets and uh, wealth than we ever dreamed we would. Hard work. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. But also opportunities that come and if you can take advantage of them you can be very successful. Well when you when you look back 
on your life, you know, how, how would you want to be remembered? Well, in honor of Mary Ellen, in the year 2000, I established a scholarship for deserving high school students who were members of Mount Moriah United Methodist Church. And I have literature here that of the church, and I must say that my mother-in-law mailed me a plate with this picture on it, and it said it was established in 1834. And I told them, Mary Ellen that they were very forward-thinking people because I was born a hundred years later in 1934. And uh, in this packet are letters from the minister, two ministers, uh, who were in attendance when these young people were given scholarships. And uh, letters from students who received scholarships. And one of the very interesting things about the female pastor was the statement that some of these students have finished school and are now contributing to scholarships. It's a good legacy. And uh, I have a, another handout from the Mount Moriah United Church that says next Sunday Mount Moriah Church will celebrate Holy Communion and award and the award ceremony of Mount Moriah Scholarship. This scholarship was set up by Patrick Wires in memory of his wife, Mary Ellen Abel Wires, for students who are applying for higher education. And I set this up, I could say year 2000, with a gift of 25000 to be used for a scholarship, but also uh, for assistance to families who were having difficulty with uh, electric bills or food. <clears throat> then Mary Ellen set up her own scholarship at UTA. And I can't recall the year, but over the years, my children and I have contributed to this scholarship and I have letters from students who have received um, these scholarships and um, all this is to go into the material but one other area of service that I've really been instrumental in is with the Fort Worth Southwest Lions Club. And I've been a member there for 35 years. And in that time, our club, because of the dedication of the members, they have uh, been very hardworking members in the sense that We currently have a program for raising money of bingo. We work bingo, and uh, it's a system that was set up by the state legislature for charitable charities who want to participate. And so it's the biggest fundraiser for our club. And. Uh, <clears throat> One of the big programs is the eye exams and glasses for deserving, um, for children who need eye exams and glasses. 
But of late, in the last five years, we've received requests by adults who need assistance. And so uh, the most recent one is from a lady named of Josephine Kitts, who is a very hardworking single lady that has had eye problems for a number of years and it just got so bad that she needed some operations. And um, in researching her situation and um, speaking with the individuals that would furnish us documentation as to her condition and the cost, mm -hmm. uh, um, I was asked to follow up with her request and uh, when we finally got the request of $5,350 it was going to cost for all this work, our club began to wonder if we could meet that. And so I checked further with the individuals involved and asked them to send us documentation as to and so and finally pursuing that they decided that they would first they would do the operation on August the third this year and then they would submit all the information to what insurance company she had and I guess any federal program that was available. And to date we have not gotten a statement from any of those departments about the cost. But if we do get the cost of finally of five thousand three hundred fifty, our club has voted to help her in that sense. And I'm submitting these documents for use uh, for the, and this is a one of the publications that our club put out called the Shaggy Paw back in nineteen and eighty five and I happened to be president of the club at that time. And it has members and information. But another area that I want to be remembered is my work with the advisory board of the Salvation Army. And they are an organization in Fort Worth that assists men in an area we work anyway in solving their drug problems or economic problems. And I've been on the advisory board for 11 years for the Salvation Army. And just for information, uh, a very dedicated minister in England in 1865 named William Booth, and he was somewhat discouraged by the Methodist Church and the way they were handling or correction, why, where they were not working in helping individuals who were really needing assistance in food and shelter. So he and his wife Catherine formed the Salvation Army in 1865 and uh, do excellent work with uh, areas that they are involved in. So that's in the sense that in the areas that I truly want to be remembered, although I do want to be remembered and my children have indicated that I am and have been a good father, um, they're a good husband to her, her, their mother, and uh, a good uh, grandfather to their children, their grandchildren. And uh, I must add <laughs> that uh, I was approached by OSU Foundation to set up scholarship. And I told them I'd be glad to do that. I'd be glad to make a contribution of $50,000. However, I wanted to break it up into two scholarships, 25000 to my mother in the School of Education and 25000 to my 
and name of my brother Paul T in engineering. The young lady I talk with says, we can't do that. We can't do that. It has to be 5,000 for your mother and 5,000 for your brother. And therefore, I have yet to establish a scholarship at Oklahoma State University in my mother's name or my brother's name. So hopefully they'll work with you. And Juliana, I must add a very important fact. And it's going to be something that I am going to be remembered by because I have a break in the alumni walkway over there in 1960 that has the first names of all graduates of Oklahoma State University. The first one being my mother Ruth, the second one Sam, the third one Paul, the fourth one Patrick, the fifth one Scotty, and the sixth one Laquita and the last name W-Y-E-R-S. So for seven really names, I got a bargain of $71 and something cents per name for that $500 brick. It's a good family legacy. Well, like I say, <laughs> I haven't talked to the Alumni Association, but I am gonna go over there this uh, sometime today and check to see if the names are still legible. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, I want to ask them, what does it take to get another brick? Is it going to be another 500 or is it going to be 250? I'm, I'm looking for discounts. <laughs> I believe in getting my dollar's worth. But also, I want to leave this document of my first grandson who and it looks like the only one that is going to get a degree in engineering uh, from Laterno University has all the information in it but as well as that is a Chickasaw Times paper that has on the front page veterans of the elders trip to Washington DC in November of 2011 uh, it's a, a wonderful decision by Governor Anna Tuppy to honor the elder veterans and they do this not just for this group but for others as time goes on. So uh, you'll see myself with the hat on uh, in that particular publication and like I say this is a wonderful article on the place my second wife and I live in Crowley, Texas, that is the best kept secret in that area. It's uh, St. Francis Village, the best kept secret in town. And we've been living there for about three years now. And my wife just loves it because as far as I know, we're the only retirement area that has its own deer herd and wild turkeys. Wild turkeys just parade in the backyard. And deer come up and cause my wife feels that they're not well fed, she buys deer blocks and also takes any cuttings and stuff out to feed them. But anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Well, uh, as we start to wind down, um, we notice that Goodness. Oklahoma State alumni have a, a great loyalty uh, to this university. Why, why do you think that OSU alumni are so loyal? Well, <clears throat> I believe it's because, one, they've had a wonderful experience as students at Oklahoma State. And I hope and pray that they feel they received a wonderful education. And. Uh, as a result of that, I know that their priorities have been, and will be hopefully, that they can contribute further to the success of Oklahoma State University by emphasizing the uh, need that 
Oklahoma State University has for scholarships and then participating in it. From hearing your, your story today, it makes me think that, you know, for your, for your family, OSU was a, was a good doorway uh, for helping lay the groundwork for really success in your, in your family. And I think, I think that's, that's very important, the legacy that your family leaves behind you. Thank you so much for sharing your, your story with us today. Patrick, is there anything else you'd like to add before we, we close on out? No, other than it's wonderful that old, the Alumni Association has set aside and arranged for this type of uh, historical effort by its graduates. Well, we appreciate you participating today.